Welcome back to the Entrepreneur Mindset Mastery Podcast, where we help you pull the weeds from the garden of your mind so that you can flourish in your life and business. Today, we're talking about the seven lies of learning as given in the book Limitless by Jim Quick. Why is this important? Well, we're going to extemporize on the importance of understanding how our individual brains work and how that relates to our ability to grow, maintain an abundance mindset, and to develop flexibility and neuroplasticity. Man, it's going to be exciting. That's right. We're going to go through all seven uh, of these lies of learning. They were um, they're collected from all over the, the mindset and self-help and development, personal growth uh, communities. But uh, Jim Quick did a great job in his book, Limitless, putting them together. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about what are these seven lies and how do they keep us, um, you know, stuck in our life and in our business. Um, so I think um, let's jump right in. Nice. Let's talk about the first one. Intelligence. Yeah, this is this is so powerful, right? Because so many people make this assumption, um, the idea that intelligence is fixed, right? That it can't grow. You're stuck think, with what you got. I, a friend shared an example, like learning a new language and there just wasn't room for it in his brain, right? Like the idea that his brain was a jar of, of marbles and, you know, to take any new marbles in, he would have to dump some other marbles out as if we can pick and choose what we keep in our brain <laughs> and what gets let go of by our brain, right? And um, whereas instead the brain is more like a balloon. You stuff it full and you let it relax with that new level and you can stuff it full again. Yeah, it stretches beyond. There is no limit. That's what's limitless. Oh. limitless. That's, <laughs> where, that's where the title comes from. Absolutely. I think so, part of the reason why the, the myth of intelligence being fixed is real, though, is because it's not a it's not a quick process. Right. It's it takes time. Um, there's no magic pill. You can't take a, a red pill or have, you know, Trinity plug you into the matrix and suddenly get smarter. Uh, it, it takes time and discipline to become genius, which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. right? well, and I think the, the scarcity idea of intelligence being fixed gets planted when we're kids in school, right? You're, you're, capable to a certain level like if if you were a b student then teachers just expected you to be a b student your parents expected you to be a b student and and a b student is all you're ever going to be even though you know there's certain certainly plausible and possible that you could study beyond that and improve your you know improve your standing but we get this idea that that whatever you've got is what you've got and you're kind of just stuck with it <laughs> and and I think um, that that scarcity, that limitation is planted by our teachers and by just the grading system in school. Absolutely. And I think it's not until we independently, whether through our secondary education, through the, the people around us, when we get introduced to the growth mindset, to personal development and things like that, that's when we start realizing that that intelligence is something that is actually fluid. It's something that, that can be expanded. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, for me, obviously I, I read the book limitless with the intention of better understanding my brain. Um, my, you know, we've talked before on the show about my mother and Alzheimer's and the challenges with that brain malfunction and, and how challenging that is. And I think it, you know, I mean, this book is just a, a powerful tool because he, he not only teaches us all these things about the brain, but then he gives us these great tools for flexing that muscle and, and stretching it and really putting that neuroplasticity to work. That's one of our favorite words here on the show is neuroplasticity because we love how the brain is and how much we can, not just stuff in there, but we can actually make it function differently and better. And it, and it really is something that I've added to my daily routine 
to relax my brain, to, to calm the, the, the voices in my brain, and then also to exercise it and use it and challenge it. And, and, and so all of those things, you know, really help for, for improving it. But I think, you know, that idea that it's fixed, right? That there's just this, everybody just, you, you have whatever you have, right? And if your parents say you've got a squirrel brain or you got a dog brain, then you go through life thinking that that's this little brain you're limited with um, versus something that can, can grow and strive for better. Um, I think a lot of our culture is stuck in complacence, stuck in, you know, well, this is the, this is the cards I was dealt. This mm -hmm. is, this is the hand I've got to hold. And I've just got to play, play with that default mode. We, yeah. We often talk about life by default here. Uh, a lot of times people get stuck in brain by default, right? This is what I got. And yeah. it can't get better, but I mean, science has, has proven that cognitive training can increase things like attention span, uh, working memory, executive control, uh, uh, emotional management, things like that. And these are all things in the brain, right? And they're all learned skills. Very much, very yeah. much. In fact, um, one of the things that I have found is that there are apps that can help you increase your intelligence level, right? The, Where's my phone, right? You can pull up an app on a daily basis, use it on the, you know, when you're sitting in the private room <laughs> and, uh, and j instead of, you know, browsing Facebook in there, spend five minutes working on your neuroplasticity, on your, uh, your memory skills and, you know, things like that. It, that one habit change can start growing your intelligence by leaps and bounds. Ooh, absolutely. Like Lumosity, I think is one. Uh, yes that you're talking about. And there's some other puzzle type things. Even uh, some of your health insurances have apps and things that they offer to uh, to work on brain health. But but I think, uh, you know, for me, one of the things that I enjoy besides reading, I love reading regular books and business books, but I also started reading biographies. And, and biographies just add so much historical perspective and so much wisdom um, and I think those can really improve your your memory and your recall and just just by, you know, learning those stories of people that have gone before. Um, Absolutely. I, I think that, um, that biographies give us a window into an entire life. Right. Very often, you know, we can look at, at someone who is currently on their journey. Um, I mean, even Bill Gates. Right. Bill Gates is I mean, he's started Microsoft in the 80s, late 80s, but he's had this incredible journey, but he's still on it. Right. Whereas if we read biographies of like Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, Thomas Jefferson, we learn over the perspective of an entire beginning, middle and end of a lifetime, the lesson they learned. I, too, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of biographies. I like I actually like to watch um, the biography YouTube channel. There's a, a historic biography YouTube channel that I'm pretty addicted to. Nice. Um, and before I go, before we go too far, I also want to throw out another app out there. It's called Happify, like H A P P I, like happiness, but happy F Y. Um, and Happify is it's if you are one of those people who uh, has challenges with what we call brain weasels, right? You've got the little voices in your head that distract you or, you know, try to lie to you about your worth, your ability and capability. Um, Happify is, is a tool that will not only combine the ability to work on your intelligence, but also um, the ability to work on uh, your emotional control. It's a, a really cool one. Wow. So I want to throw that one out there too. Yeah, that's fantastic. So the next one is kind of linked, right, to the first one. Like we mm -hmm. talk about intelligence is fixed. And then there's this idea that we only use 10% of our brain. Right. Which has, you know, been pervasive in the scientific to the self-help communities. Um, it's quoted like it's when you start talking about brain health in the lay people, not necessarily in, in, in the, the psychology, psychological community, but in lay people, it's one of the most often quoted, um, uh, quotations out there. In fact, it was 
uh, misquoted in the foreword to How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, they quoted um, William James as saying, the average man develops only 10% of his latent mental ability, which is <laughs> ridiculous, right? Um, we know this now, of course they didn't in the 1920s, um, but this thing goes all the way back. Uh, they actually believe that the source of this was in the late 1890s when a couple of um, Harvard psychologists were, were testing uh, int intellect on a, on a savant, uh, someone who seemed to have been born with great intellectual capability. And their papers were then turned into uh, popular science fiction in the 20s. And then it kind of made its way into the self-help community. Where it sounds so yeah. perfect, right? Like it's just right. a perfect quote to use. Like, oh, you only use 10% of your brain. If we can help you use 1% more, just think of how much smarter you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah. Then, of course, now the reality is we know that they can do brain scans and, and, and they can see what parts of our brain fired. And throughout the day and night, our brain is firing constantly all around all the parts for different things. And and that the brain is is a working machine, right? It's not just it's not just this collecting place or this filing system. It's it's a living, breathing, active um, computer that's much more better than any man-made computer. And much more better. Much more better. Yeah. It's a management center too. My brain is better. Doesn't mean that my vocal system is connected very well. <laughs> hey, I was tracking. <laughs> yeah. So I. It's just amazing right now that the technology we have to scan a brain that's alive. You know, it was just 20 years ago they were taking brains out of the head to cut it into slices and pieces to see what it was doing. And and now we have these machines that can actually scan and show different colors as it's the brain is firing in different parts and different activities. And, and they're learning more and more about the roles of each of the parts of the brain. And, and, and what happens when a brain hears a simple word or or a simple emotional thing happens and fires different parts of the brain. It's just so uh, amazing to me that there, we can see all of that now. Oh, without question. Uh, we, we've talked about SPECT imaging before and how they can use it to, to visual visually represent the parts of the brain that are active and the parts of the brain that are not firing. And you can look at a healthy brain and an, uh, like somebody say with Alzheimer's and you can see exactly why the Alzheimer's brain is not working the way it should. Um, but what you just said reminded me of an article uh, that my partner Leslie shared with me this week. Um, like blew my mind. Um, I want to say UC Berkeley. Let's not attribute it to anyone because I don't want to misattribute it. Um, a, a, a scientific department of a college uh, wired a uh, completely paralyzed individual up to a brain scan. Uh, he was completely paralyzed, even lost the ability to speak. Wow. Um, he couldn't control his vocal cords, but his brain still worked. And they were able to measure the electrical conductivity from his brain intended for his vocal cords. And using custom computer software and machine learning, were able to decode his brain patterns to his vocal cords into text on a screen. Wow. And then of course, if they can put text on a screen, they can make it voice. They can create yes. voice. Yes. You can actually restore speech. Wow. To a, to a paral paralyzed individual. It's amazing. Now, mind you, it's brand new technology, but you know, in 10 years, you know, speech paralysis will not be a thing. Yeah. That's, it's just so amazing that, that just, how powerful our brain is and and truly how little we understand it and and how little we take advantage of that and i think that's the big thing for you and i and for hopefully our audience is that we we want to empower people to to use all the tools they have available to them and the most powerful one of all they're carrying around everywhere they go <laughs> you know so the uh I read a great, great quote one time that said, the, um, the only thing standing between you and your 
the, the life of your dreams is about eight inches. Yep. Between here, your ears. To here. <laughs> yeah, you're carrying around a football. Yeah. The reality, though, of course, that we're trying to get to here is that, no, you do, in fact, use 100% of your brain. You know, and the only thing that's going to, to stop that is some sort of medical cognitive impairment, like a traumatic brain injury, Alzheimer's, you know, those kind of things are, you know, yes, those are challenges to overcome, but you can overcome them. What's even greater, right, is the fact that the brain automatically seeks workarounds. Like if there's a part of your brain that stops working or is damaged, the rest of your brain works and figures out ways to fire around it and, and replace it if it's possible. In many cases, it does incredible things. Like obviously Jim Quick's a great example. He had a, a brain injury as a young man and you know was told he wouldn't breathe, he wouldn't be normal, he was the kid with a broken brain. Yep. And yet he was able to train his brain and and now he's you know stands on stage and you know remembers 50 pairs of two digit numbers forward and backward in in instantly um so it you know does it just incredible stuff with his mind that people said would be impossible because of his injury um so i think that's a big a big piece is not only can we use a lot more of our brain but our brain wants to do even more. <laughs> There's no limit you, to what it wants to do. Have you ever heard of the uh, the inversion experiment with the prism glasses? Uh, maybe not. They, uh, where they actually took uh, volunteers for uh, the scientific experiment. Um, they put them in a controlled environment where they were required to wear uh, goggles strapped to their head that inverted the image going to their brain. So it was upside down? Everything was everything was upside down. Wow. And of course, for the first couple of days, they were like, uh, that's down, this is down, this is up, you know, completely lost and incapable of functioning. Um, about day three, their brains were like, oh, that's what's going on. And they were able to just function. So you I've know? seen something similar. There's they, you manufacture a bike, then the steering wheel works the opposite way. Um, so if you turn left, the bike turns right. And, and of course, that's a balance issue, right? <laughs> Riding a bicycle, you use the steering to balance. When the bike leans, you lean into, you turn into the lean. Um, but if you spend, if you spend about an hour practicing with this bike, your brain figures it out and and you can actually, yep, it's 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 almost it's it's almost instantaneous um, how it happens. And but really, what you're trying to you, what you're having to do is get rid of the old muscle memory and replacing it with a new muscle memory, and and allowing the the, the brain is so adaptive. Um, absolutely, well, the brain has the brain connects so many different stimulus, and it, it's, if you can imagine like like the spider web. I don't know that it necessarily creates a new muscle memory and gets rid of the old one. I think it changes the stimulus that triggers the muscle memory. Well, it just fires on, a, fires on a different highway, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, yeah. But the cool thing is you can go back to riding a regular bike and not have any issues. Your brain actually knows how to do that still, too. Right? Like, it's, it's impressive to watch. There's some pretty cool videos if you look for, I don't know if you, what you have to search for, reverse steering. Um, yeah, I should know. It's definitely a balanced brain exercise, <laughs> for sure. I'll see if I can find that um, that inversion experiment and share it because it's really neat to to see how the the like at just some point the brain says, "Oh, I understand this stimulus is coming in upside down," and it just it's literally instant that oh, got it. Yeah, I think the okay. same thing happens when you first time you learn to use bifocals. <laughs> You have to read a book and watch television at the same time. Read the book, watch up and read the book, and, <laughs> and it's and it's weird for the first ten minutes, and then your brain just says, "Oh, I got it," and it all makes sense, and nothing's ever blurry again. <laughs> so, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so I that, might need those. There you go. I, yeah. might, I might need those because I'm noticing that. It, so I had 20/20 vision until I was about 50, 51, and then um, over the last year, year and a half. 
my vision's gone downhill a little bit. And I'm noticing that my, my glasses perfectly correct what's far away, but I still have trouble reading what's right here. Yeah. So, there you go. That's, that's might really have to trying. investigate those. <laughs> so number three. Oh, mistakes are failure. Wow. This is a, this is a death, definite disaster zone. <laughs> right? So many people are afraid to make a mistake. So many people get paralyzed in analysis paralysis because they're afraid that if they make a mistake, they'll fail. You know, one of my, one of my favorite quotes is you've never failed until you quit trying. Absolutely. Well, and it's just so weird how, how this comes about, right? Because obviously all of us were toddlers, right? All of us made that transition from crawling to walking and, and we walk and fall, walk and fall. And no one ever said, Oh, you fall and forget it, quit, right? <laughs> that that wasn't that yeah. wasn't how it worked, I, right? Tony Robbins actually talks about um you've never met a parent who said, uh, well, you know, my kid's not really the walking type. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yet, somehow in our grading system in school and our grading system in the workplace, all of a sudden performance is what we're graded on, what we're paid for. Uh, mistakes are, you know, marked off in red, you know, mistakes are held against us. F. F. Yeah. You get the red check marks. And, and so every time you make a mistake on these things, those things are rather than being a learning experience, those things become, a negative, oh no, you're not good at this, or oh no, you know, th this was a failure, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think I think a big part of it is um, when we make a mistake as a child, we often get ridicule, you know, bullies or just you know classmates laughing at us. Um, I can tell you, uh, <laughs> I can still tell you to this day, the exact word for word definition of equilibrium, which is a steady state of balance between an organism and its environment. And in ninth grade biology class, reading sentence definitions aloud, I did not say organism. Uh oh, I left out a syllable. <laughs> and, and it was humiliating, where it could have been a positive <laughs> experience. Um, but I, I think that the, the, the big thing there is when when we laugh at people and or when people laugh at us, we're we experience a disconnection of uh, community, of relationship. And of course, relationship is one of the five domains of life. Right. So being ridiculed, being rejected for being a failure is all about losing relationship. Losing or, status. Yeah, or the or the fear of losing the relationship, right? Yes, absolutely. Just because the kids laughed at us doesn't necessarily mean that, that they were gonna break the relationship, but that's the assumption that we feel. And of course we apply that with the same force as if they were. Very right. much so, very much so. Cause it's it's all being driven by the lizard brain. Right, right? survival. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a cognitive thought process of, oh, they're not going to be my friends anymore because I made a mistake. It's like you said, it's a fear caused by the, and I've lost the word, the part of the brain where the lizard brain is. Um, yeah, it's it's entirely fear-based. But then, then you've got like, you know, in our world, you know, in an abundance mindset, mistakes are just evidence of our momentum. They are confirmation that we're trying, not Absolutely. showing that we're failing. Well, and recognizing that we change from being a prosecutor, to use another author's language, you know, a prosecutor says, you know, oh, you were wrong, blah, 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 to the scientist saying, wait, we tried this. This is what we thought was going to happen. This is what happened. Now we can change our hypothesis and then try something else. You mean scientific method? <laughs> exactly. But we're not taught to think like scientists outside of, you know, biology class. Nope. And, and that's the shame because, you know, math is all black and white and writing supposedly is black and white. And there, there's no room for for experiment. And, and really, life is just an experiment. And when you 
take on entrepreneurship, the more you're willing to experiment, the more you're willing to, to put yourself out there and try something new, that momentum is powerful. Even if you're messing it up, you're going to go further than the guy that's sitting back with that scarcity mindset, afraid he's going to make a mistake, trying to get it perfect before he starts. Yep. I love the, um, I love the, the power in the quote. Um, remember, if you're walking a 20 minute mile, you are infinitely ahead of the person sitting on the couch. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I promise you walk a 20 minute mile enough times, I guarantee you're going to get faster <laughs> unless you have a medical issue. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what happens in business. Momentum is created and, and <coughs> you are learning, you are growing and, and the universe is going to start bringing to you the stuff that you're attracting through your vibration of movement. Um, I, you and I are both big advocates of abundance being a vibration and being we are an attracting force and our brain is a sending and receiving unit. And when it's sending out signals that I'm doing stuff, join me. You're going to get the right people around you that are going to be able to help you recognize, oh, man, you've been doing that a little bit too much. Let's try this. Right. And so even if you're making bad choices in there, if you're moving you're, you're like you said, you're doing better than that guy is just sitting in the sitting on the couch. So I love that Henry Ford quote <laughs> that failure is an opportunity to begin again, but this time more intelligently. Absolutely. And then, of course, the next one's a John Maxwell quote. <laughs> sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Absolutely. Yep. And I think that that going back to the Henry Ford quote, failure is an opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. It's not about being less stupid. It's having more intelligence. And in this case, we're talking about intelligence as in data, not necessarily being smarter, right? When we fail, we're gaining information, right? And so when we try again, we have more information from which to make our decisions. And if we fail forward enough times, like how I threw that in there, <laughs> if we fail enough times, we keep getting information. Success is ultimately guaranteed. You just can't quit. It's like the dog, like the dog with the stick that's too wide for the dog door. And he just keeps trying, right? Until he finally figures out that if he drops the stick, runs inside and reaches back and grabs the end of it, he can pull it through the door. If he doesn't quit, he, he gets it through there. Um, of course, we're busy laughing at him because he keeps bouncing off the door. <laughs> however many number of times, but that's, that's really what entrepreneurship is too. It's <laughs> run that stick. To that sure dogs were put on the earth to make humans feel uh, comforted and laugh. <laughs> that's their whole purpose in life. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and there's a few dogs that were built to guard junkyards. There's just no doubt that <laughs> that's a role specifically suited to, to serve. And then there's and then there's dogs that just think they were built to guard junkyards. <laughs> I, I had a I had a Maltese, you know, little white fluff ball, a little <laughs> bit bigger than a football. And uh oh, he was a junkyard dog. He was never happier than when he was barking or digging through the trash. Nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so recognizing that mistakes give us information. And, yeah. and, and to be more intelligent, we need to use that information and apply it practically to our situation, make the changes necessary, and try again. And that is actually a perfect segue into point number four. And point number four, or myth number four about learning, is that knowledge is power. Who? You know, and, and knowledge is, well, let's quote Napoleon Hill. Right. Um, knowledge is potential power. It becomes power only when and if it is organized in, into a definite plan of attack of action and directed to a definite end. Absolutely. Oh. So I think, you know, the idea that this came from um, many attribute it to Bacon and his philosophy. And he was trying to say something similar to Napoleon Hill. Um, 
just a couple hundred years earlier. Right. And <laughs> and I, I think he was misunderstood, right? Yeah, without and, question. And it gets simplified, right? The people with knowledge have more power, and so it's easy to say knowledge is power. But it's not. It's potential power. And and so you have the potential to increase your knowledge. You have the potential to have increased power. Um, yeah, when you have when you have knowledge and you apply it in a, a business context or a relationship context, you are developing reputation and influence in your business or in your relationships. And when you develop that reputation and influence, you can then wield that as power. Just it gets you know oversimplified into a soundbite because that's what we like to do. Yeah, and we oversimplify so much, like you know. Uh, th th there's a bunch of negative right now on Facebook about Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, both billionaires, you know, choosing to use their resources to fly to space. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I obviously think a lot of that is scarcity mindset. There's a lot of limitation in people's um, comments and beliefs about the choices these men have made. But and and a lot of envy right like people want their results right they want richard branson's island or they want jeff bezos you know money and and the truth is those guys started bezos started in his garage with a sheet of plywood on two sawhorses shipping out books all right and and the bookstores all laughed at him they were he was no threat to the bookstores you know and and now of course they're all closing and Amazon's taken yes. over the world and, and now the world hates Amazon because it's provided a service that everybody wanted and appreciated. <laughs> but now, now it's the evil empire. Um, and I assume Google's the same way and, 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 and Richard Branson is, is similar, but that limitation rather than celebration, right? There's so much to celebrate in, in human accomplishment and, and in, and the, the thing resources are able to do. One of the things that we talk about is aspirational identity, right? And part of overcoming things like, um, I started to say Stockholm Center. Well, that could be the case. Yeah. Part you, are of, slave, you, know, you are a slave to your business. <laughs> but, um, no, um, it was actually, it actually came up in a conversation a couple of days ago. And so it was sitting there on the forefront. Um, part of overcoming imposter syndrome is figuring out the balance between who you are and your aspirational identity, right? And, and making that transition. And one of the things that we encounter when we're making that transition is that the people that we have around us generally don't want us to make that transition Ooh. because us changing, us becoming more, becoming greater, becoming something bigger, reminds them that they're sitting still oh. and they're going backwards because they're in decay sitting in stagnation yeah. yes so so there's this this idea that as we strive for an aspirational identity there is pushback from those around us and that's one of the reasons why we say you are the sum of the five people who are around you uh, that you spend most of your time with because we we need to surround ourselves with the people who want us to become more, who want to lift us up to their level, not hold us back to theirs. Ooh, okay. So powerful. The, the key there is that the bigger the identity, the bigger the pushback. And that's why you find people who are stuck in the rat race, living lives of default, having no ambition or aspirational identity, hate the rich because the rich have done it. They have figured out their aspirational identity. And, and yes, you know, there's always going to be, you know, the guy who's driving daddy's car because he's got all the money, right? Okay, got it. But in general, you're going to find that there is a, this disdain of the rich and the resentment of people like Jeff Bezos because they represent everything that the common Joe isn't accomplishing. Absolutely. And, and there is anything that, that average Joe, common Joe, isn't capable of accomplishing. Yeah, they don't, that's they don't, so good. Yeah, so soapbox over.
but that's where the knowledge is power gets twisted right because knowledge is potential power and and all of us have the potential to acquire that knowledge <laughs> and yep. and that's all that jeff bezos has done right i mean he started selling books out of his garage and yep. and he acquired the knowledge necessary you know i am so grateful for the things that amazon has done not just in providing this this resource of you know two-day delivery but they created the web servers necessary to make their business operate and that allows thousands of other businesses to operate on the internet because of the internet services amazon needed to to make their business function just that alone is a value that people have no idea how i don't think impactful it is absolutely not they don't and and just to add to that, I don't think there is any single company that has brought us closer to the Jetsons than Amazon. <laughs> no. Because before Amazon, there was absolutely no way that I could sit down at my computer, press a bunch of buttons, and have a drone deliver groceries to my door. <laughs> and that, if that's not Jetsons, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> Domino's, Domino's is trying. They got a little pizza robot running around potholes. So, <laughs> uh, did you notice that uh, it was Domino's or Pizza Hut was um, delivered via drone to uh, some guy standing next to a trailer in the like opening uh, montage at the beginning of Ready Player One, the movie? Oh no, <laughs> that's fun. That's yes, awesome. you got to wonder. You know, it's like if those companies are willing to pay a lot which you, you know they did because product placement isn't free. If those companies are paid a lot, is that part of their corporate aspirational identity? And and might we see more delivery companies being delivered by dr autonomous drone over pizza drivers? Man, I, I love that autonomous identity thing. Just, just uh, aspirational? Aspirational, sorry, autonomous. <laughs> Got caught up in the moment. Yeah. Aspirational identity because that really is a driving force right and you see the aspirations for companies like amazon and virgin and these companies that want to provide more services right they're not they're not in it to make this pile of money like everybody you know thinks <laughs> they're in it to provide resources and services to the world that's the value they add and that's what they get compensated for, which is why their companies are so valuable, is because the shareholders them. want them to make all the money. Absolutely, <laughs> but the shareholders get it. If we serve more people what they want, we get what we want. Yep. <laughs> and and so that's what. If it wasn't for aspiration, I think that's what our culture has lost in a lot of ways, right? John F. Kennedy was really the last president to paint an aspirational picture of what this country could do and be. And, and of course, part of that was to land a man on the moon. And I don't, I don't want to be too preachy or negative, <laughs> um, but it was around the, the 70s and the 80s that politicians figured out that they could ob obtain their objectives more easily with a... Um, less intelligent, less critical thinking populace who is working against one another rather than aspirationally. Whew. That's powerful. Sorry. All right. That leads us to number five. Yes. Learning new things is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So Keep it clean. This, <laughs> you know, I, I struggled with this one when I first heard it because I spent a year living in Costa Rica to learn Spanish, and I promise you it was not easy. But no. the truth is, it also was not hard. <laughs> it required focus, and, and it required time. But the truth is, what Jim Quick reveals is that we've never been taught how to learn. School piles us up with all of these things that we have to learn. You have to learn math and you have to learn language and you have to learn science, but we're never taught how to learn. And so the idea of learning something new is overwhelming 
for the majority of people. And it creates anxiety and upset stomach and just the idea of, ugh, I got to, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in fact, I, I firmly believe that if you want to achieve your aspirational identity, the number one skill to learn is how to learn. Oh. Without question. Absolutely. And that, that doesn't just mean learn the process. It means start implementing the tools that are introduced by the process. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that's why, you know, it's interesting. So much self-help becomes shelf help. And everybody <laughs> wants that. Everybody wants to learn, but they buy all these self-help books and they shove them on the shelf. And mm -hmm. even if they've read them, they're inspired a little bit, but they don't really break them down and apply them to themselves and to their life. And, and the truth is we can learn so much, just, just like learning a language. If you learned a new word every day, that'd be 52 words at the end of a, you know, I mean, 365 words at the end of the year, but you have to take the time to, to learn the word, apply the word, use the word, right? There's, there's all these ways to make that word a part of your, your vocabulary. And that's, that's learning how to learn <laughs> is yeah, the tools to use. And it does take time, but it's and, not and, that's, and especially with language, that's a great example. That's multi-sensory learning because you're reading the text. The voice inside your head is saying the word. You're using your voice to say the word, right? You're, you're getting, you're applying that word into different aspects of your brain, different storage areas, if you will, because the brain processes speech and text and kinesthetics very differently. So the more regions of the brain that store data about a given subject, like a language or a skill or anything like that, the more interconnections it's making between all those different regions of the brain. And when you, when you, you know, file, oh, I need to remember the word, you know, what's the Spanish word for door? If you've gone through a door and said the word while you look at the door, you've got all these other possibilities of, re of recalling it rather than just if you had memorized that word by rote. Yeah, I so I we learned the trick and of course ours was a, a biblically taught school and and in the old testament they were they were encouraged and taught. I mean there's Bible verses that teach to write the Bible verses on your doorposts and, and the different parts of your house. And so we do the same thing when we're learning Spanish. We put, you know, the label on the door, <laughs> you know, puerta. So every time you walk through the puerta, you realize that's a puerta. And and then the mirror in the in the bathroom and the so so every door, every item in your house, and you put a three by five card card on it. Now you see the item and you see the word. You relate the item to the word. And then of course, if you say the word, and then you know, just because at the end of the day, it's valuable. You know, what words did I encounter today? So I can write down puerta, espejo, and <laughs> and baño, and all of those things start to make it easier and easier for your brain to adapt to learning. But you have to take advantage. Jim teaches speed reading, and so many people are afraid. Oh, if I read faster, I'll comprehend less, which is another myth. But you still need myths of learning. You still need to. to when you speed read, if you want to remember more of what you read, he encourages you to write down what you've learned, but then on another column, write down ways that you can use it. And so it's even deeper, right? And he talks about teaching it, right? Doing what we're doing right now. Take what you're learning in this book and teach it to somebody else. That's another level of learning. And, and you read differently if you know you have to teach something. And so, so powerful. This that limitless book, and you we've already reviewed it. If you haven't watched our review of it, that's a great section, a great thirty or sixty minute conversation. Because not only does Jim teach us all these things about the brain, he gives us all the tools to make it happen, um, including how to learn and how to study. <laughs> so we just we also just did a uh, an episode a few weeks back on mind palaces and how to use visualization for uh, learning things like this. So 
you get all these different memory and cognitive strategies. Uh, no excuses. Mind, mind maps, uh, learn to, you know, learn with the intent of teaching, um, multi-sensory learning, all this kind of thing can help you learn more and more easily. And so I think the, the main place, main points, point that we want to make is kind of took the whole middle of the sentence out. Um, the whole point that we're trying to make here is that uh, don't let fear of failure, going back to the last one, keep you from learning because learning is a skill just like anything else. And if you haven't been taught how to learn, you can learn that first and that's going to set you up for success. Um, I want to actually, I'm going to drop this in the, in the chat. I'll also drop it in um, uh, the Facebook comments on this. Uh, for our podcast listeners, uh, maybe we can put this in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, there is a Coursera course called Learning How to Learn, and it introduces a lot of these concepts that we're talking about. And you can go to Coursera and sign up for their, their, their service and then audit this course for free. Nice. Uh, so I'm going to drop it in the public comments here. Um, I mean, there's just so much power in your ability to learn, right? If you have the ability to learn anything, you could pick up a book, you can listen to a podcast, you can, you could, you can become an expert in whatever subject that you want, and then start teaching it to other people, and and create a business around your expertise in this area. And so, definitely, learning how to learn is one of the most powerful things. But it really is a matter of getting beyond that idea that learning something new is hard and that fear of getting something wrong and making a mistake in the learning process holds you back. And so don't don't let that happen. Of course, that leads to number six. The sixth lie is uh, so powerful. And that's the reason the other five exist, right? The criticism of other people matters. You know, one of my, my favorite motivational quotes was when I first got started as an entrepreneur. Oh, no. And I'm mind blinking on how it starts. Um, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. It, it, it was something along the lines of uh, your opinion will matter as soon as you're signing the checks that are going into my bank account. Nice. <laughs> and if, they, if, you're, if your name is not on the check. Talk to the hand. Yeah. Darn. I should look that up. Well, I think there's a real challenge, right? The idea that we live our lives in the fear of what other people think of us. And it's really the fear that we put on ourselves of what we assume they're thinking of us. And well, we talked about that earlier when we were talking about how criticism, um, um, not criticism, um, when, when kids... What's the or word? Mistakes or failures that you know when when yeah. uh, kids are laughing at us that they're yeah, breaking the there, relationship. There's that sense of of causing damage to the relationship, um, ridicule, right? The, that sense of uh, breaking the relationship. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about. Other people's opinion of us somehow creates our value. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and the idea that that their opinion is what's going to pay our bills, right? <laughs> like, uh, but, but we're strongly driven by wanting people to like us. We're strongly driven by wanting people to admire us and, and feel good about us. And so, so there is a driving force within us to protect that. And I love, so Tim Ferriss, and, and we talk a lot about Tim just because he's, he's gone on this road before us and, he had this same problem very strong like he couldn't push against you know the, the opinion of others just dictated his life and and he chose to get on the bus and ride the bus and get off at a bus stop and lay down on the sidewalk right in the middle of downtown everybody in the public square and just let people laugh at him and call him names and do whatever so that it forced him to recognize that, you know what? Nothing these people say changes anything. <laughs> and nothing these people say changes who I am. 
because I'm laying on the sidewalk, you know, doing weird stuff, right? Um, and and it was his way of pushing back against that idea that that the opinion of these people matter, and and he was teaching his brain that that it doesn't matter what these people say or do, I can be who I am, and my identity is not affected or impacted by them. And that's now yeah, that's so it was so powerful to me uh, to push back against that. Once you recognize it, there's ways to push back against it. Um, yeah, I liked um, Bob Proctor actually said, um, uh, if I want to be free, I got to be me, not who, not the me who you think I should be. Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I like and that I, one. I really love the, the Jim Carrey conversation. Jim and Jim Quick and Jim Carrey little, you know, sat side by side and had a conversation on a, on a movie set. And, and Jim said, I act the way I do because I want to give the people who are watching permission to be themselves. And Jim is on a mission to to help the world feel better about itself, and that really impacted me. Like I, I have a whole new level of respect for Jim Carrey because he cares he cares about other people, not just himself in his acting, um, and that said a lot to me. Yeah, I I highly recommend anybody who hasn't watched the Jim Carrey commencement speech to go oh. and do so. Right out, don't go now. That's right. Wait, wait till the end. Nope. Yeah, do it, do it in ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's really important because you know, coming from that place of scarcity, I could see that you know, Jim saying you know Jim Carrey saying that I want people to feel free to be who they want to be. I could see that being so. Um, sorry, I've got something going on over here. Um, I can see that being something that uh, Jim Quick, with his focus on uh, you know being true to yourself and and allowing yourself to heal the the challenges in your brain, how that's so. Uh, I mean, connecting those two is so powerful, right? Because sometimes people who have like a TBI or who have something going on in their brain that prevents them from being their own authentic self, you know, that, I don't know. I, I think just, we, all, we all hold ourselves back. And certainly if you've had a traumatic brain injury, that that can hold you back even more and, and yeah. require more work to push against. But being concerned about what other people think, um, I think that's what happens with, with kids that have a stutter problem. And mm. because most of the folks that I know that, get into adulthood and they still have a stutter issue it it's enhanced in a stressful environment like a board meeting where people are questioning or or you know you're you're being pushed for you know to back up your view and and that causes them anxiety and the anxiety impacts you know their ability to push through their their stutter and and yet if you let go of that it goes away and so, so much of what we do is based on what other people think of us. And certainly it's really what we think other people think of us. <laughs> um, right. and, and, and so striving for that aspirational identity, not only do we want others to see us differently, we need to see ourselves differently and gain a new identity. Yeah, if you're doing your best, you can ignore the rest. Oh, there you go. You know? No, and you're recognizing not. nobody else is in the place that you are, right? Especially the people you're leaving behind because they're coming mm -hmm. at it from scarcity and fear. Oh, man. You're making progress that they're not making and they're going to they're going to wrap ropes around your ankle like like those frogs in the bucket. They're they're going to reach up, pull you down because they don't want you getting out because <laughs> no, no, you belong down here with us. Um, and and find those people that are going to be on the top edge of the bucket saying no no come on up here with us we're going to pull you out and escape you know so speak your truth be the ask be the person that you are longing to be and then find the people that are on your side find the people that are going on that same journey i think um, it's important too to to remember to be generous with yourself whoo, allow, allow the fact that like every other human being on this planet you're not perfect no one expects you to be 
And so everyone, everyone who has laughed at you when you do something that, that is imperfect is forgetting the times that they were. Oh, yeah. You know? The bullies, so, the bullies are actually, if they're laughing at you over it, then chances are that's exactly what they're wrestling with. They're covering up something in themselves. Absolutely. Their self-esteem is lower than yours, I promise. But the cool thing about being gentle with yourself and recognizing this is it teaches you to be generous with them as well. And and you don't have to fight back against their comments. You just recognize this isn't the circle where I belong. Yeah. And and you can leave without without emotion and without um, hurting feelings and, and having to attack. Um, and, and that can be such a powerful place to be, right? So talk about a place of power. Whoa, absolutely. Knowing, knowing that the the easiest response is the right response, which is to simply disconnect and disengage. Absolutely. Yeah. That's empowering. Whew, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the day I realize that what other people say to me doesn't doesn't necessarily have to impact how I feel is powerful, super powerful. And takes away the power of the bully because whatever you your words really don't <laughs> don't have an impact. I get to choose how I feel. You don't choose for me. Yeah. <laughs> And that's really and powerful. And it's through it's through reacting to them rather than responding that they get their power, that they get right. their sense of accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, I get that. So we're um, coming up on the top of the hour. Let's um, let's hit number seven. Genius is born. Yeah. Oh, I must. I'm not a genius, so therefore I must not strive for it. <laughs> I wasn't born smart enough. Right. Yeah. Where there's the, the truth is, um, yes, there is such a thing as a savant, but that is the exception, not the rule. And the fact is, most geniuses are created through passion and perseverance, then latent in, uh, ability, then lost where I was going with that. Well, if, yeah, they're not born with it. They actually, they, they learn. Right. It's a learned skill. <laughs> and... And it really comes about through focus and perseverance. Yes. They, they, they finally find what they love and they focus on it long enough to, to be the very best at it. Um, I think one of the Olympic athletes just said, you know, being an Olympic athlete is simple. Um, it takes two steps. Do what you love and become the best in the world at it. See, simple. Simple. <laughs> simple. Well, I mean, when you think about it, like Michael Phelps, who is at this point the most metal decorated Olympian in history, uh, he did two things. He managed his diet and he swam. <laughs> yeah, he, and, he was swimming for eight hours a day. And he was a terrible swimmer early on. So oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it took a lot for him to grow into him himself. Um, and then, of course, his body is definitely a gift for his ability as a swimmer. Yeah. But well, you know, he still swam six hours a day or more. <laughs> and, and I think that's true a lot of the time. Most geniuses are often considered failures until they find their zone of genius. And once they find their zone of genius and they give it sustained effort, that's when the genius blossoms within them. Right? You know, we hear stories about Einstein being uh, fired from a patent office, you know? Yeah. He wasn't in his zone of genius. Well, and Bruce Lee was is one of the great examples. And, and learning the art of Kung Fu um, until he figured out his own place in that, he was lost. But oh, yeah. he struggled to fit in on two continents. Yeah. <laughs> That's a challenge. Once he, once he found it and he was allowed to, to develop it, he obviously became one of the earliest successful Kung Fu artists in the world and probably one of the most well-known to this day, even though he's been dead for more than 30 years. Yeah. So, Do you know Bruce Lee's favorite drink? Mm, no. Water! <laughs> nice. Water. <laughs> I knew <laughs> knew something silly was coming. Oh, it had to be. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. He um, he left behind a legacy of 
striving for excellence. You know, he create he actually created his own branch of kung fu. You know, combining yeah. everything that he learned through uh, the old guard kung fu and even influenced by Hollywood and street fighting and you know it, this is, oh, judo for him it was focus on what worked yeah this is this is a, a and i think it was that focus that also made him such a philosopher oh and it wasn't it, it was he was not just a uh, i don't want to say just jackie chan i mean jackie chan's a, a pretty smart guy i think i think you know as people find their excellence you know, maybe that's maybe that's part of it. As you find your excellence, you also find philosophy. <laughs> yeah, I think the two go pretty hand in hand. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. The seven lies of learning. If you find <laughs> you're struggling in one of those areas, you know, fast. leave a comment. Let us know. Um, next week we're talking about. Uh -oh. next, next week we are talking about time management for entrepreneurs. How to use tools to be more intentional about the use of your time. Oh, I'm going to surprise some people next week. <laughs> oh, that's going to be fun. Yeah, so we'll be taking responsibility for our time. That's I love that. So looking forward to that conversation. So hope you'll join us next week. And look for us on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts. Our, all of our episodes are up there now and hopefully getting lots of listens. So like us, give us five stars. If you have uh, questions or comments, be, be sure to leave them here on the Facebook group. We'll see you next week.